Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for the Santos Tour and under stage three, the final stage of the women's race with one categorised climb. The big one starts in the city of, well, not really the city of Adelaide, it starts north, uh, northeast near the base of Monacute, or north of Monacute rather, and goes up to Lobethal, so around the hills, no real like no real savage climbs or anything like that. Two intermediate sprints, one at Lobethal, one at Gamaraka, and then they come back down, I think, Gorge Road, then turn left to do the corkscrew climb, which would be decisive. 2.4K is 9%. I still don't really trust that. I think it's not 2.4K is at 9%, um, although there are steep sections in it. And then there's the all-important descent to the finish, which is actually longer than in the men's race. The descent in the women's race is 7.5 Ks. In the men's race, it turns right at the base of the Montecute descent or the end of the Montecute descent and turns right. It's only 6 Ks. So 1,500 extra meters of false flat sort of downhill for an attacker to navigate. Okay. We had a, a breakaway pretty early. Was at 73 kilometers to go that Danford, Georgia Danford and Gina Ricardo, who we already saw in the breakaway a few days ago, both got in the breakaway. These riders took the first two spots at the first intermediate, and we saw a sprint in the group behind from Daria Pikulik, who took the final second and the final point basically at that first intermediate. So nothing important for GC, which is kind of the the value that we look for in these intermediate sprints. And the same thing happened in the next one because Lucinda Stewart of ARA also bridged towards the breakaway, so three riders are up there now. So all three took the points and the seconds, the bonus seconds, for of the intermediate sprint. So we saw no intermediate sprint bonus seconds for a Brown, for a, a Spratt, for a Manly and a Roseman Gannon, for example. So we would be going to the corkscrew climb with the seconds that we had in GC already the day before. But there was some action before corkscrew. I feel like Trek was trying something with Hansen before the climb. What do you think the... The idea was there. I don't really know, actually. Like, I thought Trek might try and get a satellite rider or someone in the breakaway, put pressure on bike exchange, because if you start the corkscrew with your team all in one place, they can't help spread afterwards. Uh, yeah. Same goes for bike exchange, really. Like, if Manly drops, then Roseman Cannon, who's also up there on GC, is probably just going to stay with the group ahead. So, yeah, it's an interesting GC position just to remind you of where everyone was. Manly was in the Oka Leaders jersey, only eight seconds ahead of Georgia Williams, in fact, who was second on EF Education, Tibco, Silicon Valley Bank, who was, uh, I think, yeah, she was on Bike Exchange last year. So she just signed a one year, I think, with EF. She's in second. Grace Brown, third on the same time. Roseman Gannon actually ahead of Spratt by one second in fourth. Spratt on 14 seconds. And a lot of EF riders and young riders. Anita Boisman sort of from fifth to fifth, 12th close by. But yeah, the question was, would Spratt be able to drop everybody? Would she be able to hold it off on the descent? The Hanson move, I don't really... Yeah, I don't really... I don't really know what... Well, because <laughs> basically an FDJ domestique went with her yeah, and nothing else. And then Brody Chapman just had to pace behind anyway. It felt like it just meant Brody had to do a longer pull at the start of Corkscrew where Hanson might have just been able to extend that a little bit longer because there's no need for Brown or Bike Exchange, j to react to that. Why do you think they did that? I, d- I didn't really see it either. If it was earlier, let's say it's like 30 kilometers earlier, then it's f- to send the rider upwards, forwards to try and get someone in the breakaway, like you mentioned, as a satellite rider. But it was so close to that final climb that I didn't really get it completely. Now, Zaf was also kind of pushed into chasing with Maggie Cole's Lister, for example, be- being the rider that was pacing there for Di Francesco. So I feel like maybe it caused Zaf to pace a bit, but hey, like... What value does that give Trek? I don't see it. I don't see the value there. So eventually we got to the corkscrew bottom and Zav leads in like the first 500 meters or something. And then Chapman immediately takes over, which is basically the last domestique left for Amanda Spratt going into the climb there. And Chapman's tempo is hard. Like half the group's gone by the time that Chapman has a decent pull already done. And Manly's struggling at the back. So Manly struggling in the Oakwood jersey, not dropping yet. Roseman Gannon sitting in third position. 
I was starting to feel like Rosamund Gannon, who was close in GC, might end up being their leader because at that point in the race, you can't do anything else, eh? Because commentators were saying maybe maybe Rosamund Gannon should now go to the back of the group and try and get nah. Manly to the front. But it's so early on the climb that <laughs> yeah. she's bloody well fucked. Exactly. That's the thing. It's not like, oh, she just loses three seconds at the summit and then with someone helping on the ascent, she can bring her back. Like she was moving back at the base of Corkscrew and it's, yeah, the only then chance for Jake or Lula. I mean, Roseman Gannon at that point was still a live chance to win GC. Whilst Manly was gone out of GC, Roseman Gannon, Brown and Spratt were all live chances on three different teams and actually Georgia Williams, four different riders yeah. actually on EF on four different teams were live chances to win GC depending on how the corkscrew played out. But as a reminder, the Zwift Hub Challenge, you've got 12 days left, ride just 12, 25 kilometers on the Zwift Hub Challenge on Strava to unlock $50 or 50 pounds or 50 euros in North America, the UK and most of Europe for a chance to, yeah, to unlock, well, not a chance, you do unlock that amount of money off the Zwift Hub <laughs> if you buy one, but you go into a chance to win $1,500 or £1,220 worth of indoor cycling tech. You can do it with a virtual ride, an outdoor ride, a hand cycle ride. It's the best value smart trainer on the market. It was Bicycling's best smart trainer overall of 2022, and there's no better time to get one of that those Zwift hubs. They've been incredibly popular. They're easy to set up. Me and Benji a testament to that. And thanks to Zwift <laughs> Hub's automatic resistance, you'll feel every climb and descent throughout Zwift's virtual world. So go and check it out. Join the Strava Challenge, and you get that Zwift Hub for an even better price. But uh, Corkscrew played out as we expected. Chapman smash, Sprite attack, a little bit early. I thought she she kind of she did set tempo for a bit, like I said yesterday, and then kick again because yeah. Brown was still there, like three seconds, two seconds behind her through the first really steep hairpin. And then did you notice? Yes, Brad gave a second kick, Benji, out of the last hairpin, and that's where we just saw Brown. That's the last time we saw Brown for quite a while. Yes, yeah, certainly. Like you said, it before that that extra move that Sprat did, she was so close. She was keeping up the gap. She was keeping up the tempo. And because she's so close, she can see her in front of every corner. After every corner, she can see that Sprat's ahead of her. And after that attack, that was not the case anymore. Sprat had a decent enough gap for that not to be the case for for Brown not to have that carrot hanging ahead of her to be able to chase her so easily. Now, when it comes to G3, the, the group behind Brown, we also saw some changes because that's when Manly took the tour down under a bit too seriously, everything upside down, because she started riding in reverse and she basically dropped from the group after holding on for quite a long time. Rosamund Gannon being one of the one of the stronger riders, also an EF rider that was doing really well. I think it was uh, Double Hickok. I would expect because I would expect her to be a better climber of the three of that group. But it was really down to Brown as the only rider that could potentially still do something here for the stage win because the gap was extending not only between Spratt and Brown, but also between Brown and that third group. And that kept on going towards the top, I'd say so, because there was no real pause of Spratt at any point. There was no real pause from Brown at any point. Or did you see a moment on the climb where you were doubting Spratt for a bit? No, I thought, ooh, this isn't as big as I thought it might be. But then again, the coverage was pretty pretty rough, um, I would say, for the last yeah. eight kilometers. Ad break for us in Australia during the really? Monocute descent. Yep, love it. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> like, yeah, really, 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 really tough, that coverage in the final. But, yeah, we didn't really know where Brown was exactly, I like I think it was like 15 to 17 seconds over the crest of corkscrew and she would have to both win the stage and beat brown by two seconds more than two seconds on the road to take gc it wasn't enough just to win the stage she had to also win by three seconds or more and i'm like i then was you know brown's probably got more of a more horsepower it is a pedaling descent particularly the end of that montecute descent it really is a pedaling descent 
and advantage Brown there. And that's where she seemed to make back all the time, although we didn't see it too much. EF set up a three-rider train with Abby Smith, I think, Double Hickok and Georgia Williams. And I'm thinking if they come back, Williams can still win GC. I think Roseman Gannon was in the group. So there's still all these options. Basically, I don't know where we see maybe with 2.5Ks left, Brown's got Sprat in her sights. And so I'm thinking yeah. even if Sprat holds on, GC's done because Brown will close down that within, you know, to within a second or something pretty easily. And a second is a big is a big gap on the line too. Um I wonder, Benji, if they finished where the men finish, would Sprat have won GC and the stage? Just fifteen hundred meters less. That's a very good question. We'll never know because it's the it's the gradual removal of the gap from the top of that climb, the course through climb to the bottom towards the finish line that makes you doubt that because on the descent, it's logical that Brown can't instantly see Sprat because there's so many hairpins still in that descent. But the second it became a straight road, it became clear to us, to anyone watching that, Brown was going to catch her. And especially the fact that that 1.5K is extra in this race. And she crawled through that wheel. And then it's then it's a, a game of who's going to be the fastest sprinter because Sprat's had a pretty good sprint in this race in stage one, for example, on the right side of the road, sprinting next to Pikulik and Sothov in that stage one. But Brown's damn good when it comes to these one-to-one -one sprints. We've seen it in the Burgos stage in, I think, 2021, where she uh, destroyed two people in, a, in an uphill drag sprint. We've seen it in, I think, another sprint, I swear, last year somewhere that Brown won a a head-to-head -head sprint with someone once again throughout the year. So we've seen it a few times around that that happens. And Brown was forcing Sprat into first wheel because... I don't know if she, she was. Does... I, I, I kind of put that on Sprat. Yeah? I okay. think Sprat... Because, like, what's stopping Sprat literally breaking to zero kilometers an hour? Like, she didn't do nah, that. That's a good question. Uh, and uh, riders refuse to do it. When you can see, like, Sprat was clearly uncomfortable being first, right? She clearly yeah. didn't want to be there, but yet they don't. And I think the reason she didn't partially was because she was like, if we get caught by Roseman Gannon and the EF, I don't even podium this race. Yeah. Then it's um, like, I'm still. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I thought there was a chance. I, even then, I thought there was a chance Georgia Williams could still win. I was like, if they finesse too much, she could still win. I mean, Sprat as well got unlucky with. She had to wear the QOM jersey. It was flapping everywhere. Um, the bars are also super wide. So whether those two things cost her over the last two days, they kind of helped either of those two things. But, yeah, she sort of just – they then just sit to the side and Brown's like, all right, I'll be seeing you. Starts her sprint and just <laughs> does Sprat completely, who doesn't really get in the draft too much and was generous not to be given – to be put on a second in the end of this stage with Brown winning both the stage and GC Spratt coming second, 13 seconds out of the group led by Georgia Williams, who takes four bonus and uh, third on GC. Daniele, Daniele Di Francesco, I'd say quite a good stage race yeah. for Zaf. Yeah, like they got to be happy with that. Gannon, Rosamund Gannon in fifth, she lost a tooth on the descent. Um, what? I'm not sure. Which she sent. An yeah, actual she tooth. Lost, like, nah, she said she already had a fake tooth from the crash before and she oh. like, lost it. Um, so she's going to go get that fixed. Um, nail and six, Henrietta <laughs> Great Christie, analysis. seventh. Pardon? Great analysis. She's going to get that fixed. <laughs> That's what she said. She said she's going to get it fixed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Claire Steele's eighth, Doble Hickok, ninth, Ellie, Ella Wiley, tenth, and Abby Smith. 11th, I think she was on domestic duties for Georgia Williams. So revised GC round wins. Santos two down under. The first women's world tour race of the year. Spratt second. Williams third. Roseman Gannon fourth. Nine seconds behind Williams. So, you know, Manly got, where did Manly come in? She came in on 38 seconds. I don't think Roseman Gannon waiting would have helped uh, that at all. Mainly dropped loads of positions on GC. A double Hickok fifth. That's really nice. Christie sixth. She moves up places. Varley seventh. Nalen eighth. De Francesco ninth. And Abby Smith tenth. That's three in the top ten for EF. Pretty, yeah, pretty good start for EF, Benji. Especially as a few of them are young riders. Two of them are. Yeah, certainly. Abby Smith is, is very young as well. 
uh, 20 years old. We spoke about her in yesterday's podcast, I recall, but also in other teams like Henrietta Christie, also 20 years old, riding for Human Powered Health, winning the white jersey in this race. Ella Wiley, riding for New Zealand in this race. And I think she, uh, I think she rides for the new local Wahoo, Life Plus Wahoo or something is the, is the new name of that team, as Life Plus basically gave the team life again after a local jump chip there. So that's, that's pretty great for the future in, in Australia, I'd say, that those two riders are showing, showing a lot here. What that will translate into when it comes to other World Tour races and races throughout the season, that I don't know yet. So I'm looking forward to see what these three riders will do in other races as well throughout the season. But also just, it's, it's so interesting because a rider like Daniele Di Francesco, like that's a rider that you see performing in the Bay Quit, you see performing in the Australian Champs, Santa Stone and Under. But when it comes to the other races throughout the season, last year she was also quite strong in Australian Champs and Oceania Champs, but then didn't really perform on the road in Belgium in those 1.2, 1.1 classics. And then I questioned myself, will her opportunities at Zaf change that? Because now she will be able to get to raise more of these Conti races in Europe. And potentially she could show herself a bit more and therefore be another Australian that could do some stuff on the road here. But uh, yeah, I actually really enjoy the Santa Student Under. I don't know why. Like, it's something different. It is not the top competition. It's not the World Tour riders like Von Vleuten and Sofo fighting it out. But Grace Brown is a top-level rider, of course. Amanda Spratt showed that she's she's back at the top when it comes to her level. Or would you say that this doesn't prove yet that she can compete again for the race that she did in the past because this oh, was no, this is way better, better. this is yeah. way better than what she has been doing in the last two years now whether i can't i haven't looked at the numbers whether it's ex- exactly as what she was yeah. like in 2017 18 i'm not sure uh but it's certainly a lot better like she she did you know put 17 seconds into brown on corkscrew which is not that long a climb and dropped it yesterday so i feel bad for sprat the parkour really wasn't it wasn't suited to her in the sense that with the descent finishes on both occasions, but it provided some really exciting racing uh, with that balance between the pure climber, the sprinters, the versatile sprinters yesterday, and then the you know overall all rounder like Grace Brown being able to reel that back in. It definitely made the race a lot more interesting. If it just finished on corkscrew, there yeah, obviously Sprout wins GC easily. Yeah, interesting dilemma. We know that Amanda Spratt transferred over from Jayco to Trek Segafredo. What would the race be like if Spratt was still at Jayco? Would she have a better chance of winning GC or not? Maybe Roseman Gannon could have paced the climb a bit better. Um, I don't know. But two then she of the three. Have in the, in it. Yeah, but two of the three on the top ten and G, no, two of the three on the podium in GC were on Jayco last year, Williams yeah. and and Spratt. So, and then Rose McGannon was fourth. I don't know. It's tough. Like you, I do think teams are not generally, across men's and women's, they are not aggressive enough um, in one week races and, you know, four or five day stage races with adapting to the parkour. They're like, ah, oh, well, you know, I know the climb doesn't finish, the stage doesn't finish on the climb and there's a descent, but, you know, we'll try like, you have to really accept, like, no, like, if you don't have a satellite rider, it's going to be really, really tough for Sprat to stay away. Yeah. Like, she has to be so superior on the climb, and she was superior on the climb, but, you know, she needed, like, 25 seconds, or more than 25 seconds. But she probably needed 30 seconds because Brown was coming back. Like, she – so, it's tough. Um, but it's good to see Sprat in good shape. Brown's in good shape, obviously. In the terms of the Swift Young Riders jersey, Henrietta Christie, who Benji already mentioned, wins that and so yeah human powered health nice little nice little start to the season for them uh yeah, they're world Piccolo. tour unlike their men's team what do you expect from a Piccolo, for example because she, that that sprint was that's not like an odd one out eh? she's had decent sprint 15 european champs last year we can't say that that is a, a terrible sprint and now winning a world tour race now it is santa stood and under it's not like the tour de france farm still a different level but this does say that she can compete for a top five to seven in a a Tour de France from sprint, no? Yeah, yeah, probably that. Um, the sprinter's field wasn't that solid here, uh, yeah. I must say. Like, and of course, like, 
you know, Vibas and Balsamo is just it's just ridiculous how good they are, particularly Vibas. Um, so I don't know. It's it's tough with one of those one off ones. Maybe it's she becomes like a very consistent top sprinter or maybe just panned out on a weird stage and a weird finish. Um, probably that she will be quite a consistent uh, you know, decent sprinter around the traps. But yeah, FDJ get the job job done. Um, whilst the team mainly helped with positioning for Brown today, they really saved the race yesterday. This wasn't possible without Duval and Arjes chasing yesterday, chasing yeah. Sprat down because GC would have just been over uh, <laughs> if that if they hadn't done that before even this stage. So they did their work yesterday and saved the race for Brown, who then was able to get the job done today. A really, a really exciting race. Any other sort of tidbits from this, Benji? Um, things you noticed, things you change before. They do Cadells. I assume a lot of these riders will do Cadells. Yeah, most likely. I wonder if like the echelons in stage one, if that was continued and Brown actually lost time there, that might have also impacted GC. I don't I'd have to look back at the echelons very in depthly to see what went wrong there, whether it was just the wind stopping or also the fact that Trek decided not to pull through. Because let's say it wasn't the wind, and Trek's decision is what made that group with Brown come back. Then there's also something there when it comes to how Grace Brown still won this race, stage two as well, like you mentioned. So there's parts everywhere where Grace Brown was really vulnerable and got attacked and maybe other teams tried to benefit from it and it didn't work. Maybe they try, didn't try enough to benefit from it. Who knows? But in the end, Grace Brown basically did it. Eh? She, she stormed back in that ascent. She delivers that, that win and the women's Santa stood and under is over for the year, which... Oh, I, it's, there's one shame for me. I, yeah. I do think, I don't know whether it's because, you know, I look at all the teams in Women's World Tour and, you know, 15 sort of 15 riders on the roster is about the average or median yeah. amount of riders on the roster. I do think it's a shame, even though I am a bit biased. I think this is a pretty well run race by yeah. Women's World Tour standards. Like, even though I've complained, like, it still does have extensive <laughs> live coverage with, you know, Matt Keenan and Gracie Elvin, top commentators. All the riders, mo- you know, stay in top hotels. They're at the Hilton for the week. Um, there's a big teams presentation. It's got equal coverage with the men's pretty much. A- and yet we don't have many of the top teams here, which I think is a real shame. Like, yeah, I don't know whether that's a money thing or logistics or they just they need those riders for other races coming up in Europe. I don't know. I thought that was a, it's a little bit of a shame in that, you know, this race is doing a lot, th- a lot of things right compared to other races that have popped up and to not have SD Works, DSM, Yambo Visma, Movistar, you know, Lippert came second in this race in 2020, then won Cadell's, uh, her last win, I think, in 2020. So that was a little bit of a shame and I hope to see some of those teams back next year. Firmly agree. And we've mentioned this in the podcast before. It's the fact that we've had so many additions to the World Tour, Women's World Tour calendar that we now got like 89 Women's World Tour race days or so. That's extreme for these teams with 15 riders. And I think Phoenix de Koenig is probably the only uh, the only team that has a, uh, a next level amount of riders with 19, which is the opposite extreme because most of the teams are like 13, 14, and maybe 15 uh quite uh, like three teams or something but it's starting to be noticeable that these teams now have to select their races carefully and they also need to keep in mind that they need to get as many uci points as possible so i'd argue that the teams that went to the santa student under here might have had easier uci points than the ones that will go towards i don't know some other world tour race throughout the season i don't know if it's julia's world tour in the women's calendar but that's an example i'm just going to throw on the table let's say uh, see sd works and so forth go there there's going to be teams that go there instead of the santa student under and realize okay maybe we would have gotten easier points at the tour down under for example so hey it's beneficial for jaco and for for trek and for fdj and the teams that went here so it's good on them to uh to actually decide to come here yeah, and like Trek have shared resources, like I was speaking to their press officer, um, who was very, very nice, and she's the press officer across both teams. So like with the teams that have both the men and women's team, they can sort of have a 
some economies of scale and the infrastructure and resources they have, maybe same mechanics, they don't need to send two separate teams. I'm not sure how FT, I think FTJ is completely separate. So yeah, they're not in that basket. But yeah, oh, Jayco is the same. Like I, for example, I went, just finished that point, I went to the, the team like hall and it's the same mechanics working on the bikes. The bikes are all the same there. Um, but yeah. A good race. We will cover the men's prologue tomorrow. It's a 5K road bike prologue looking finely balanced between Hayter, Sheffield, Plapp, Matthews, and some outsiders. Fine. Patrick Bevan, for, for example. Who? Fine. No, I don't think so. No offense, Joe. <laughs> Too technical? Uh, it's just a 5K. <laughs> it's, it's the sprinters <laughs> <laughs> track, guys. Here we in Matthews. the national. We'll see his nationals, um, his TT national suit though. So, yeah, um, apparently that'll be. We'll see that. Um, so we'll cover that tomorrow because we don't. Yeah, one-off pods for. By the way, a five K prologue. I think not. Do you by any chance know what the reason is behind the factor that it's road bikes? Because with San Juan, for example, in the past it was to equalize the field with like the smaller teams, the Conti teams, and so forth. But isn't it mostly World Tour teams at the San of Sudan under? Yeah, it is, but it's just the same logic. Like, are we really going to go to all the hassle and expense, combine it across all the 20 teams or whatever, less, you know, 500 grand or something of transport? I don't know. I just pulled yeah, that yeah. up, made it up, but two or 5K <laughs> prologue on a bike path? Yeah. Come on. Um, so I'm glad they're doing it on road bikes, frankly. Apparently, any still yeah. will have their TT bikes here anyway, training. Um, maybe okay. they thought it was on TT bikes. No, nah, I think they're just making sure they're training on it. Um, in other news... The appeal of Dr. Richard Freeman, who was the former Team Sky and British Cycling doctor, um, the High Court in the UK has dismissed his appeal, which was his appeal was against the decision by the Medical Practitioners Tribunal service that his name, they removed his name from the medical register. And I th- I'm pretty sure the UCAT investigation paused whilst that process was ongoing. So now the UCAT investigation, which uh, to me, will be slightly more interesting because it's you know an anti-doping body. Uh, that investigation will be slightly more interesting. Uh, the result of that, but if you want to follow that closely, Sean Ingle and Matt Lawton on Twitter. Um, well, they're not on Twitter; they're they're journalists at <laughs> the Guardian and <laughs> elsewhere. But you know they're covering it on Twitter as well as writing articles. Um, they're good places to get further details and cover that. But yeah, we'll see what happens For, with the UK um, investigation. For context, is this related to that package that arrived at some the point or something with thing, testosterone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I'm not in depth into whether it. Sh- whether Shane Sutton had Viagra, no, not Viagra, whether he had um, needed it for erectile dysfunction or something. I've got to go look at their quotes again. They're pretty, <laughs> pretty out there in like denying, <laughs> denying that he needed it for that. And then, yeah. Crest was the laptops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I got, I got to revisit it. It's been a while. Uh, I can't believe the U- now the UCAT investigation kicks off again. I feel like this started <laughs> ages ago. Um, anyway, we'll update you on maybe the UCAT investigation when that's done in five years <laughs> and the statute of limitations has <laughs> <is> expired. <laughs> um, but otherwise, we'll be back for the prologue plus stage one recap of the men's TDU tomorrow. Hope you enjoyed the women's coverage. I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, thanks for, ben, yeah. for getting up. The week's not over for him. We'll see you with that tomorrow. Ciao.